guys and welcome to Warehouse Church. My name is Sarika and it's so great to see you this morning. If this is your first time here, we want to thank you for being our guest. Um, and we invite you to text the word welcome to the number on the screen. This will allow us to keep um, in contact with you and help you with your next steps. Our number one goal is to see everyone experience transforming relationships with Jesus Christ. And we will meet you right where you are and lead you to where God wants you to be. <laughs> um, coming up, we will sing songs of worship together. Then Pastor Rick will lead us um, in our conversation called Taking Back Your Life, which has probably been one of my favorites so far. Um, don't forget to have your Bible app ready. Um, it's a free download on the App Store or on Google Play. And you can follow along under the Events tab with us and uh, take notes or whatever it is you want to do. And as the worship team starts singing... <laughs> Stand, say hi to everybody around you, and let's worship together. When all I see is a battle, you see my victory. The battle belongs to 
there's so much good biblical truth in this song, church. The phrase that we've been singing over and over again, no longer a slave, I think it's spoken about in Romans. I could be wrong. Um, but I love, I love Romans, but I love that thought that, that we were born into sin, but now we no longer have to be a slave to it. That we were bought with a price, we received that free gift that was free to us, but it cost somebody. This free gift of salvation, it's amazing to, to have experienced that. These are the things that I know. I know that God is in control. I know that what I want and my preferences don't necessarily matter because whatever His will for my life is gonna be, it's gonna be greater than anything I've ever thought of that it's hard to understand why bad things happen sometimes because you think you're a good person and you've done what God wanted but he never promised us a bed of roses he promised us that if you declare my name and if you love me then the world will hate you he's told us that we need to pick up our cross and follow him every day those are not nice things my heart is burdened for us as a people but I know that the church is stronger than all of that. down from 
thankful that that grave is empty this morning church yeah. oh my goodness because that grave is empty he gets to give us that living hope the hope in today tomorrow and forever lord we just come to you this morning lord and we just thank you for this time together this morning lord a time to set aside and worship you lord as a congregation lord to worship you what is better than worshiping you in a group of believers who just all can celebrate your name. Lord, we just thank you this morning for that living hope, that living hope that comes from that blood that Lindsay talked about earlier. Lord, the blood that covers us and makes us new. Lord, that blood has so much hope in it. Every ounce of it is hope and joy and peace. Lord, we just thank you so much. Lord, I just pray over this surface, Lord, that you will just move among us 
as you already have been doing through the first service and through this, this first little part. Lord, I just pray that you touch somebody who might need you today, Lord, in a way that only you can do. Lord, I just pray over Pastor Rick, Lord, help him speak words that, that you give him, Lord, just speak through him so we can all learn and become a little closer to you today, Lord. Just help us rejoice in this day that you've given us, Lord, in this time we have together. Lord, I just thank you again just for bringing us all here. In your name we pray all of this. Amen. Warehouse Church. Good morning morning to those of you that are watching online as well. We're so glad that you're with us today. And anyone excited that we are free in Christ? Okay, a couple of us are. That's good. That's good. I'm glad. I'm excited. Uh, I think let's give our worship team a huge hand for leading us in some amazing worship. And if you are not primed and ready to hear God's word this morning, then you were like asleep during worship. So It is good. Well, we are back, and this is it. It's week five of our series called Take Back Your Life, and uh, and so we're wrapping it all up today. And if you have your Bibles, I just want to invite you to go ahead and turn to 2 Samuel. Uh, So whether you're watching online or you're in person, just go ahead and uh, find 2 Samuel. It's in the Old Testament. It's kind of towards the beginning of the Old Testament, and uh, and we're going to be hanging out there. We're going to be camping out, and we're going to read the entire chapter of 2 Samuel chapter 6. And uh, I know as you're looking at it, you're like, man, that's a lot of word. That's a lot of reading. And, and I probably could have trimmed it down, and I probably could have picked out some important parts, but I feel like we need to see the whole uh, event that we're going to read about. We need to read the whole entire story. It's going to be good for us. It's going to be good to, to hear it all. So let's just jump in. Let's just jump in this morning. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 1. And, uh, and so this is when David is bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. And so uh, it's a big deal. So let's just read it together. It says, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Bala and Judah to bring up from the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. And they set the ark of, the, of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, not Ohio, but Ahio, Sons of Abadab were guiding the new cart, and with the ark of God on it, and Ahio was walking in front of it, and David and all the Israel, all of Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets and harps and lyres and timbrels and sistrums and cymbals. In other words, David is bringing the ark of the covenant. He's bringing the presence of God into the city of Jerusalem, and he's throwing a party. Like the band has been warmed up, it is pumping, the music is going, the lights are going, the the music is great, everybody's celebrating. And then in verse 6 it says, when they came to the threshing floor of Nikon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act, and therefore God struck him down, and he died there right beside the ark of God. It's pretty serious. Verse 8, it goes on. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. And David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? See, David had been planning this event. He had been so excited to have the presence of God in the center of the city. And now it's not happening And in verse 10, he was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obi-Wan Kenobi. No, took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obi, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now, 
Verse 12, King David was told, the Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obi to the city of David with great rejoicing. And when those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf wearing a linen ephod. David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. And while he and Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and sounds of trumpets. So it's a great victory dance. It's dancing and singing and lots of partying going on. Verse 16, as the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, also wife of David, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in his heart. And they brought the ark of the Lord, and they set it in its place in the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. And he had finished uh, finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, and he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites. Both men and women and all the people went to their homes. David, when David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul came, out to, Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked and full of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. So she's not very happy with her husband. And David, verse 21, said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. Verse 22, I will become even more undignified than this. I will be humiliated in my own eyes, but by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. Back in the late 1800s, there began uh, work on one of the most ambitious building projects of its time. It was the 50-mile stretch that we call today the Panama Canal. And it took 30 years to build this amazing uh, shortcut that would save boats on average 8,000 miles. Uh, It would save them an 8,000-mile trip around South America. So it created a passageway from one ocean to the next. And during this time of construction in this area, there was an epidemic that was going on that took over 23,000 lives. It was called malaria and yellow fever. And it was taking lives at rapid rates. And the experts uh, at the time, uh, they believed, with all of their hearts, they believed that the culprit behind this epidemic was not the mosquito, but rather... It was ants, and that they did everything they could to keep ants off of people, especially the sick people. And during the first 20 years of construction on the Panama Canal, about 20,000 of those 23,000 people died. Almost all of them died of either yellow fever or malaria. And the experts were convinced that it was the ants, and they, so they wouldn't allow anyone to purchase screens for the hospital windows, which would have kept the mosquitoes out. But instead, you know what they did? They had the bright idea of taking every hospital bed, lifting it up, and putting bowls of water under each leg of every bed to keep the ants from climbing up the beds uh, to attack the people, the sick people. In the meantime, the windows were wide open, and you know what loves stagnant water, don't you? Mosquitoes. And so this disease ran rampant so they were, while they were busy trying to kill the ants. And 20 years into the project, the French ran out of funds. And so the president of the United States at that time and America took over the construction. And they finally put two to two together and realized that it wasn't the ants that was causing the problem, but rather it was the mosquitoes. And so they put uh, installed screens on every single window. And they got rid of all those little bowls of water that were hanging around. And they saved thousands of lives. 
And the point of this is that you can do the right thing the wrong way, right? You can do the right thing the wrong way. They were fighting the disease and doing everything and doing everything they could to get rid of it. But they were just fighting the wrong enemy. They were fighting ants when they should have been fighting mosquitoes, and that is exactly what's happening in this passage that we just read. We see Uzzah doing the right thing, but we see him doing it the very wrong way. And so let me back up a little bit because of what God does here in this passage. For many of us, it seems a little aggressive, right? It seems a little, uh, a little crazy, that, and even David is shocked by it, and we know that David's desire from the very beginning, from the get-go, was to bring God to the center of his life and to bring God to the center of the life of the nation of Israel. And David was so excited to bring the ark, which symbolized or represented the presence of God, into the center of the city of Jerusalem. And so no sooner had David taken over the city of Jerusalem, no sooner had he done it than he was uh, decided to bring the ark of the covenant back from where it had been sitting for 30 years collecting dust into the center of the city of David. And you see, the Philistines, if you know your history, the Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant because they had seen what the presence of God had done. They'd seen the blessings. They'd seen the results of the presence of God, and they're like, we want that. And so they took the Ark of the Covenant, and what they found out is that for them, it didn't bring good luck, but the Ark of the Covenant or the presence of of the Ark of the Covenant only brought them uh, misery and tragedy. And so they're like, we got to get rid of this thing. And so they returned it to the Israelites and they parked it at this guy's house. And Uzzah and Ahio were their, were their sons. And so here sat the Ark of the Covenant and it had been sitting there for 30 years. And now David, David longs. He can't wait to see the ark, which symbolized the presence of God, finally, and the glory of God, finally be back in their presence. And the ark is a big deal. In the Old Testament, the ark was a huge deal. It was this golden chest. It was very ornate. Uh, inside this box, was the, you would find the Ten Commandments that, that Moses gave to, or that God gave to Moses. And uh, not the original ones, because he broke those, right? He's like, oh, I broke my tablet. It's shattered. And, uh, and so it was the ones that he gave to Moses, and they're inside this box and, and, and the Ark of the Covenant, and it was uh, to be uh, known as the presence of God, that wherever the Ark was, that's where the presence of God was. And even in Psalm uh, 132, David talks about the Ark, and he talks about how he couldn't sleep at night. He talks about how he couldn't even eat because he just longed to see God's presence in the heart of the nation of Israel. He could not wait. And here the day has arrived, and David's so excited. He's got the band out. He's got the party favors. He's got everything. He's throwing a huge shindig as the Ark of the Covenant is coming. And he talks about this, and he talks about how he longed to see the whole nation of Israel take back their lives from the idolatry that they were worshiping, from the foolishness that they were living, and how he wanted the ark to be restored. He wanted there to be joy. He wanted there to be gladness that would come from having the presence of God in the center of their everyday lives. He longed for his people he longed for the Israelites to tap into a different way of being human, uh, of, of not just doing the things that their neighbor did or what the world did, but to experience the joy and the hope that came from being in the presence of God. And so we see David delegated uh, this family that had been taking care of the ark for three decades to return it to Jerusalem. And Uzzah and Ahio were those, bro were those brothers of the son that where it had been staying. And Uzzah has this really bright idea. He's like, yeah, Uzzah, that's right. He's like, he's like, let's bring the ark back in style. Like, this isn't any, it's no longer 500 B.C. This is 400 B.C. It's time to bring the ark back in style. And so he, he, he says, let's do it the way the Philistines did it. And he creates this cart 
This amazing, spectacular cart that the Ark of the Covenant's going to roll into town in. Like, y'all, it was like a, it was a spectacle to be seen. Like, it probably had spinners on the wheels, right? Like, it was like low ride, and it had lights underneath it that were sparring. It had gold flake. I mean, it was like, it was just, it was an awesome sight, this cart. He says, we're not going to bring it in on the poles. We're going to bring it in on this cart. And so, again, the right thing being done in the wrong way. Because if you knew your Bible, like Uzzah knew the Old Testament, he knew the Torah, he knew that in Exodus 25, that it specifically prohibited any other method of transportation for the Ark of Covenant than the two poles and the four dudes that were, uh, that were um, uh, descendants of Moses from the tribe of Levite. He knew that that's the only way. But Uzzah's like, you know what? That's the old school way of doing things. We're going to do something new. We're going to like pimp God's ride, and we're going to bring this really cool fancy cart, and we're going to bring it in. And, and so these, these guys, and you oh, the picture's gone. Was it up there? I didn't look. So these guys, they, they, they weren't even supposed to touch the ark. Like the, the, the ark had rings on it, and you would slide the poles through the rings. You wouldn't touch the ark. And then you would lift it up. And again, if you weren't a Levite, you weren't supposed to do this. And the ark was never, ever, ever to be touched by human hands. But Uzzah had a better way, right? Uzzah's like, man, we got to get with the times. Like, it's, it's, I know what's best for us. We got to bring this in right. Like, David's excited about this. And we got to bring God's ark in in a different way. And then when it began to tip over because the ox stumbled, what does Uzzah do? But he reaches out to catch the presence of God, and God strikes him dead right there on the spot. And, and again, it seems harsh, right? Like this moment seems crazy and harsh, like, whoa, that's kind of aggressive, God. Like, like, like God, do you have anger issues? I mean, it seems unwarranted. I mean, it's just one little touch. Like, it's just one time. He didn't even give Uzzah a warning, but the reality is, is that this is the tip of a much bigger iceberg in Uzzah's life that we're seeing here. Because Uzzah had spent the past 30 years guarding the Ark of the Covenant. Like he had spent 30 years watching over it and understanding the regulations. He knew backwards and forwards what Exodus 25 said. He knew about the Poles. He knew about the Levites. But he's like, but but we got to do something different. It's a new age. It's a new day. And I know today I hear people saying, well, God, that's the God of the old times. Like, this is new time. God needs to get with the times. Like, God needs to get with the times on so many of today's issues. And, and many of us are just like Uzzah. But the reality is, is that Uzzah is, is only thinking for himself. He knew what was allowed. He knew what wasn't allowed. And the problem was that he was obviously began to feel like self-important. Like, I got this title. I'm in charge of the covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. I'm in charge of the presence of God. And he's like, I got an important job. And he kind of puffs his chest out a little bit, sticks it out, out a little further than normal. And, he, and he's proud about it. And he's like, I got this. I got, God, I don't, I don't need to know. I got this. I'll get you to the city of David. And he has this important job. And, and, and so often, God has given us an important job. He's given us the important job of carrying the message of Jesus into the world, and that's a big deal, and that's an important job. But we must never confuse the important job we've been given with, the great inflate, with a great inflated sense of self-importance, like, look at me. I'm saved by grace. I got this. I'm better than you. That just because we're saved, church, doesn't mean that we ignore the things that God has called us to do. And, and we're able to do sort of what we want to. Like we can never have that attitude that just because we are slaves, just because we're no longer slaves to sin, just because we're free, doesn't mean that we get to do whatever we want to do. And Uzzah had adopted this sort of religious formality, if you will, like just going through the motions, like Uzzah's just checking off the boxes and his reaction when God starts falling over, the Ark of the Covenant starts falling over uh, to put his hand out and to take care of God. I got this, God. I don't need to obey your rules and regulations. I'm just going to do, I know what's best for me better than you do. 
I know that I don't have to obey everything that you told us to do with the Ark of the Covenant. I don't need to do the things that you've called me to do. I know what I need to do. It's enough that I brought you along. Isn't it enough, God, that I brought you along? I mean, look at my cart. Look at the cart I made you, God. I mean, it's a pretty cool cart. I mean, he's spinning the spinners. He's saying, check out the lights. Like, there's multicolored lights on this thing. Like, it's not just blue. It's whatever color you want. And he's like, look at what I've done. And look at this nice cart that I gave you. And I wonder if we're any different from Uzzah. Like, I wonder if we're like, God, I'll bring you to church on Sunday. I'll bring you with me to church. You can come to church with me. You can sit next to me. I'll sing about you. I'll get excited about you on Sunday. But, God, the rest of the week, it's my time. Like, the rest of the week is I'm going to do whatever. The rest of the week is Miller time. It's whatever I want to do. Like, I wonder how many we, how often we do that. Like, we bring God with us on Sunday morning, but then we ignore God the rest of the week. You see, Uzzah, he heard the same music. Like, David's got the band going. The music is pumping. It's a party. And he hears it. But there was no dancing inside of Uzzah's soul because he was outwardly um, spiritual, but he was going through the motions. He was just checking off boxes. We get the idea or the impression that there was no passion for God on the inside because if there was, he would have never built a cart. If there was, he would have never tried to catch God. And this shows us in this story that I want you to hear this, that God is not an impulsive God just waiting for someone to blow it so he can smite them, but rather that Uzzah had clearly been on a journey for a long time where God had given him opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to open himself up to the reality that there was more than just outward professional. It was more than just a job. It was more than just checking off boxes that he needed to do because he was just an important guy. That God was looking for a passion inside of Uzzah. And so here's the truth, and I, I think you need to let this sink in, that this is kind of the beating, the heartbeat of the message is that a religion you can control has no power to save your soul. A religion that you can control has no power to save your soul. Uzzah thought he could control God. He's like, I got this. I'm going to build a cart for you. Forget the poles. Throw them away. We're building the cart, and, and I can touch you, God. I know what's best for you better than you do. And I would say that any religion that you and I think we can control, it has no power for Uzzah, there was no life. There was no pulse. He was in control. He knew what was best for him better than God did. And God was just riding around on his little toy cart. And he reached out his hand to catch God because God was going to fall. And let me just tell you something else, too, that you don't need a God you have to catch, right? You want a God who can catch you when you're falling. And so Uzzah's death which had been slowly unfolding for years, finally became permanent. And David sees it, and David is horrified. He is horrified. He's caught in the middle. He had the best of intentions. He wanted the ark to be in the center in the presence of the Israelites. And he's like, bring the ark, crank up the music. We're going to have a party, and the music is bumping. And then he sees Uzzah's carrying the, carrying the ark in on a cart, and he's probably thinking to himself, I'm really not sure how that's all going to play out, but, but, but Uzzah must know what he's doing. And then as soon as he sees that Uzzah's dead on the side of the road, and David's freaked out. And David's like, cut the music, man. He's like, everybody go home. Party's over. We're done. We're out of here. Uh, you just go home. Uh, I don't know how to deal with this. And he sends everybody packing. And the text says that David was angry at God and unwilling to go any further. David was pumped and so excited. He had been dreaming about this day when the presence of God would finally be in his presence. And then it all gets, goes south. It all gets sideways, and he's confused, and he doesn't understand, uh, and, and, and he's angry with God. And what does God do? Well, as we read, we say God does nothing but pour out blessings. He just continues to pour out blessings because that's who God is, right? And so God can handle your emotions. 
It was okay that David got angry with God because God has broad shoulders, y'all. And God can handle your anger. He can handle your frustration. He can handle your confusion. He can handle your hurt. He can handle when you're crying in the middle of the night out to him. God can handle that. And so David leaves the ark. He leaves the ark with Obi-Wan Kenobi, I mean, with Obed. And, and God just starts pouring out his blessings on Obed's life. Like the text says that God begins to pour his blessings out on Obed's family. Like they are, they are winning, y'all. They are victory after victory. God continues to pour out blessings and because that's who God is. God is so good. And, and he blesses even when he's ignored. God blesses. And David hears about the blessings. He hears about what's going on at Obed's house. And he's like, man, I got to get me some of that. And so he's like, all right, let's try this again. I mean, it's been three months. Let's give it another shot. And so he says, uh, but this time I've learned a few things, right? David's like done his homework. And he studies up on Exodus 25. And he's like, y'all better burn that cart. Like, I don't ever want to see that cart again. He's like, you get the poles out. And you get the Levites, the four dudes, and you put one on each corner, and you don't touch the Ark of the Covenant. You put the poles in, and you bring it here. And so they began to bring the cart or the Ark back to the city of David. And so here we see in the scripture that it says that they take a few steps, right? It says that they take six steps, that on the sixth step. And I love this because it's like step one, step two, step three. And when they get to the sixth step, David's like, stop. He's like, nobody move. And he's like, uh, uh, uh. And then he brings a sacrifice, and he brings a sacrifice, and he butchers it, and he offers it to God. And it tells us that it's not just any offering either. It says that it's the burnt offering. And what was so special about the burnt offering was that before it was offered up, before you offered up the burnt offering, what you would do is you would place your hands on the head of the animal that was about to be sacrificed, and you would transfer all of your sins you would confess and transfer all of your sins into this animal that was about to be burned up. And so the animal actually became a substitute for your sins. And it was saying that there's a price to be paid. David knew that there was a price to be paid for his sin. He's like, I've done some horrible things. I've done some messed up things. I've screwed up. I've messed up before God. And so he places his hand on the burnt offering before it's burned up. And he transfers all of his sin into the animal. And I'm just, and he's like, thank you, God. And he transfers his sin to the animal and then it burns up. And it's essentially, it's a picture of the cross. You see, the whole system of burnt offerings, they were pointing toward to the day when Jesus would hang on the tree for our sins, that Jesus would be substitute for our sins, that he would pay the price. As Isaiah says, the sin of us all was laid upon him. And God looked, God looked at Jesus who never sinned, who was perfect and blameless as though he had committed all sin so that he, so that God, uh, so, that, so that he might look at all of us who have sinned and see nothing but the righteousness of God. You see, Jesus paid tribute for our sin. Jesus was the substitute for our sins. He paid the price so we didn't have to. And we say, thank you, Jesus, that you were willing. Thank you, Jesus, that you were willing to be our substitute. And you see, David realized and learned from his experience that, that the problem was Uzzah had a sin problem and that he looked good on the outside, but he was dead on the inside. And David's like, no, nah, that's not happening to me. He's like, I realize that the only way that I can stand and before the presence of God is if someone deals with my sin nature. So on step six, David says, stop right there. He sacrifices uh, the burnt offering and, and someone else deals with his heart. So what he was doing with the burnt offering Again, was he was pointing forward to the cross, like so much of the Old Testament does, pointing to Jesus. And it was significant that he had taken this step right before the seventh step. Right before the Levites took the seventh step. It's so important because you see in the Bible, the number seven is a significant number because it represents wholeness. It represents completion. It represents like a whole revolution. And, and it's like seven days in a week. And then what happens? A new week begins. And David was saying at the sixth step, stop. And he's saying, there can be no wholeness. 
There can be no wholeness. There can be no completion without forgiveness. And David knew that he was a sinner and knew that he needed forgiveness and nothing could be accomplished without God's forgiveness. You see, it's not, just a, it's not about ju us just being good enough. It's not about us just carrying God in our cart to worship on Sundays. It's not enough about us just going to enough church things. It's not about, about us just checking off the boxes so that God will, we think that God will eventually go, wow, look at what so-and-so is doing. They're doing such a good job. That's not what it's about. It's all about someone who had done nothing wrong, but who was willing to pay for our sins so that we can be whole again so that we can live in freedom from our sin. And the only, and only then can there be a seventh step. Only then can be, we be right with God. Only then can there be wholeness and peace and joy on the inside. That's that same peace and joy that we crave. That we crave. And when the sixth step and then the sacrifice, and then they took the seventh step, and when the seventh step was taken, then and only then did the music begin to play again. As soon as they took the seventh step, David, David gave the band the signal like, pump it up, turn it up, let's get moving. And it says that David began to dance. It says that he began to dance, but as he began to dance, he realized, oh my gosh, there's a problem. I'm wearing king clothes. I'm wearing royal garments, and this wouldn't do because David knew that he was in the presence of the king of kings and the lord of lords, and so David takes off his outer royal garments, and then it says that he begins to dance like he had never danced before. He began to dance with all of his might. He was giving it everything that he had because he realized that the presence of God was passing by and he was a part of the parade. He was a part of helping bring the Ark of the Covenant into the center of the city and the center of the nation. Why? So that more people could experience it and so more people could know the joy that is found in a right relationship with God. So we see what the deadness led eventually in Uzzah's life. And here's the deal, and I want you to hear this, that God didn't just come to affect your schedules. Like God didn't just come to interrupt your Sunday mornings. He came to radically turn your life upside down or actually upside right to invade every square inch of your life to where you, like David, right, where you are carried away by the music of the one who loves your soul. To invade your life in such a way to where you leap and you dance and you sing with all your heart. Uzzah wanted to keep God on a cart. Uzzah thought that he knew what God wanted better than God knew. And, and he wanted to keep him there. And that's, uh, that's, where, he, uh, that's where that got him. And, and guess where it got him? It got him to death. And if we're going to take back our lives, church, here's what you need to know. We must allow God. We must allow God to invade every part of our lives to the point where we're dancing. You need to embrace that. If we're going to take back our lives, if you're going to take back your life, if you're going to live your life knowing the will of God, if you're going to live your life on the mission that God has created you to live, then you've got to allow God to invade every nook and cranny of your life to the point of where you can't help but dance. So let me give you three quick, take, take, three quick takeaways uh, as we wrap up today. The first one is this. Don't let failure stop you. Don't let failure stop you. In the beginning of, of 2 Samuel 6, uh, David started with some great intentions. He wanted to bring the presence of God back into the center of the nation. Everything gets sideways. Everything goes south, and he quits, right? Like he quits halfway through. He's like, I'm done. Everybody go home. We can't do this. And it took him three months it took him three months to give it another shot, but he didn't give up. Like, he didn't quit completely. And he came back to it, and he picked up the reins again. He said, we're going to do this. And he got the band back together, and he said, let's practice. Let's get ready, because the presence of God is coming back. And listen, if we're not going to always get it right. We're not going to always get this Christian life right. We're not always going to be right in our relationship with God. We're not always going to get it right when we're sharing our faith. We're not always going to get it right at being a holy 
person, but you just got to keep trying. Don't quit. Don't give up. David gave it another shot, and I would just encourage you if you're feeling defeated, you're feeling like you can't do this thing because you're a failure, don't give up. Give it another shot. The second thing I want you to hear is this. You are never more vulnerable than after a victory. You're never more vulnerable than after a victory. You see, David was victorious, and he gives everyone a snack lunch, right? And it wasn't just a, it wasn't like peanuts and a drink on an airplane. That's what you get. Uh, if you're lucky, you get a bag of peanuts and a, and a drink. It wasn't that kind of snack lunch. It was like a, re- a royal snack lunch. Like, it came out of the royal kitchen. It was, it was amazing, And he gave every man and every woman, it says, a snack lunch to take home with them. And he sends everyone packing, and then he goes home excited. He's dancing all the way home. And when he gets home, bam, his angry wife is waiting for him, right? And she gives him the what for. She she gives him, uh, she she just rips him a new one right there. And, And let me warn you that when you experience spiritual victories in your life, I want you to be aware that the enemy's going to try and mess you up. He's going to try and do anything he can to get you sideways again. And David, David could have easily gotten discouraged by what Macau, his wife, said about him as she began to throw shade his way. But here's what he chose to do. He chose to say this. He says, no. He says, you're not going to, you're going to not going to steal my thunder. You're not going to steal my joy. He says, I'm going to be even more undignified. You think that was undignified? You think dancing in my, my underclothes was undignified? I'm going to be even more undignified. Meaning that David's about to ratchet up his passion. He's about to get crazy. It's about to like, uh, the, the floodgates are about to pour open on his, on him. And he's going to show her some dance moves that she's never seen before. I mean, nothing is going to stop him from celebrating So be aware, be aware that you are never more vulnerable than right after a victory. And then finally, the last thing I want you to know is this, what you see is what you get. What you see is what you get. They all looked, Michal and David and Uzzah all looked at the same Ark of the Covenant. They all looked at this chest that was covered in gold, but they all saw different things, didn't they? Like Michal saw a, a king who was humiliating himself, and, 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 and he should have kept his robes on. And Uzzah, Uzzah saw a means to an end. He's like, I know what's best, better than God does. I'm going to build this cart. We're going to make this fancy. And he saw that. And David, though, David saw the king in disguise. He saw the presence of God. And what do you see in front of you? Like when you look at your kids, when you look at your life, when you look at your job, what do you see? Because what you see is what you get. When you look at your kids, when you look at your job, when you look at your spouse, when you look at your life, you can see, you can choose to just see normal, or you can look and choose to see just average and just see the things that you're not thankful for. Or, or you can choose in the midst of it to say, hey, This is the king. This is the king in disguise. This is God's presence. I see God's hand in my marriage. I see God's hand in my relationships. I see God's hand in my job. I see God working everywhere. I know that he's got a plan for he said, I formed you and made you in your mother's womb. And you are are wonderfully and fearfully made so that you can do the amazing and good works that I planned for you long before you were born. And so we can say, I see that God's up to something in my life. We can choose to be like Uzzah. We can and choose to be like Macau, or we can choose to be like David and say, God's up to something. He's got a plan, and I'm going to choose to live my life on faith. And so, church, we need to walk around a little more excited than we are as Christians. We've been redeemed. We've been rescued. We've been saved from our sins. We are free from our sins. They no longer have a hold of us, and we need to always be aware of that, and we need to be excited about that. We need, to, we need to speak to our children in that way. We need to speak to the king and our child or the queen and our daughter. We need to speak to, to uh, our, our spouses and our friends that way and believe that God is up to something. Like people need to look at us and say, I don't know what's wrong with them, but I want what they have. Like I want what they've got because there's something different about them. Because here's the deal, church. God has not forgotten about you. He has not abandoned you. He's just in disguise and waiting for you to see something. And he's waiting for you to say something because what you see is what you get. So what would it be like if if every sixth step we took, we would stop and we would trust God and we believe that we will see the things completed in our lives that he has promised us? And that we will begin to see our lives not as half empty, but as half full. 
Let's not go through the motions. Let's stop checking off the boxes like Uzzah did. Let's stop being negative Nancys like Macau, only looking for the, the negative stuff in life. And let's let God, let's let God invade every part of our lives in such a way that we can't help but dance. You know what I'm thinking? Maybe it's time to have a dance party in here. Maybe we need to be a little more undignified and allow the joy that is in us to flow out of us so that others might experience the same joy that we experience in our lives. You see, if you're going to take back your life, you're going to have to become a little more undignified. As the worship team comes up, let me just remind you of this, that Jesus... Jesus has substituted himself for you and for your sin. And I would say to you that the least, the least that we can do for him is dance. Don't miss the chance to take your life back. Don't miss the chance to live a life of joy, unexplainable joy. But instead, allow God to come and to invade every nook and cranny of your life so that you might experience the joy that leads to dancing. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you for your word. Because, Lord, we thank you that in your word we find so much truth truth that helps us to live our lives in the way in which you created us to live them. And Father, I don't know if my friends gathered in this room today, believe it or not, but they were created to dance. They were created to dance with you and for you. And Lord, just as David realized that he had a sin problem, that in order for him to dance, he had to ask for forgiveness for the sins in his life. Lord, we too have a sin problem. But God, you took care of our sin problem with Jesus because you sent the only one that was pure and holy and blameless. And you put him on a cross and you killed him for our sins. For our unholiness so that we might have the opportunity to be in right relationship with you. God, if anything else, nothing else happened, that would be enough to cause us to dance. But Lord, you didn't stop with the right relationship with us. God, you promised us that we would be free from our sin. God, you promised us that we would have joy and hope and purpose in our lives. God, you promised that you would never leave us, but you would always be with us. So God, not only are we forgiven, but we now have hope, and we have a purpose, and we have a God that never, ever abandons us. So that should really cause us to dance. So, Lord, my prayer is this morning that I know there's some people in here that, Lord, they haven't allowed you to invade every part of their lives. But they're being honest. They put some barricades in different areas in their lives. Father, maybe, maybe pornography is the barrier. They don't let you into that part of their lives. Or, Father, maybe it's unforgiveness, that they won't forgive someone, and that's the barricade they put in their lives. Or, Father, maybe it's like their self-image. They don't see a creation created by you when they look in the mirror and they get down on themselves so they don't let you into their, into that part of their lives. Maybe it's depression, maybe it's anxiety, but Father, maybe there's some barricades, some places that we don't let you in. Father, my prayer this morning is, is that you would, you would knock down those barricades. God, you would remove those obstacles and that we would allow you to be a part of every part of our lives. Because, Lord, when we let you in to every part, we can't help but dance. 
Lord, that we would become even more undignified in the way we live our lives for you. Because it no longer matters what the world thinks. No longer matters what our neighbors think. It no longer matters what our family thinks. Because we are overflowing with the joy and the hope and the purpose that comes from you so much that we'll do whatever it takes to be one of yours. Father, there's some other people in this room that have never given their lives to you. Lord, they came this morning not knowing what to expect. They didn't know they were going to hear about Jesus. They didn't know they were going to hear about uh, sin in their lives. But Father, it's resonating with them and they're understanding and realizing that they do have a sin problem in their lives. That they, that they don't have hope. They don't have purpose. They don't have joy. That they're missing out on this amazing and beautiful relationship that you've created for us. Lord, if that's them, if, they're, if, you, if you're in this room today and you've never said yes to Jesus, today can be that day. Today could be the day that you say, God, I realize that I've tried to live my life without you. I've, I thought I knew what was best for me, but I'm realizing that you know what's best for me better than I do. And that I have sin in my life and I have messed up and I need your forgiveness. And I want you to come and be the Lord of my life. Come and be the King of Kings and Lord of Lords in my life today. If that's you, just pray that. Just invite God into your heart. It's not rocket science. There's no magical prayer you pray. You just invite God in. Just say, God, I recognize I'm a sinner without you. I'm lost without you. I need rescued. I want to dance. Would you come and be the King of kings and Lord of lords in my life? Would you be present in my life today so that I might have hope, joy, and a purpose? God, we love you. Lord, thank you for loving us. God, help us to stop checking off the boxes. Help us start living for you in such a way that people around us start going, hmm, I want what they're having because they have some amazing joy in their life. May we be undignified. May we not worry about what other people think. But may we live our lives fully for you. Because if we do that, Lord, not only will all our lives change, lives of the people around us and our community will also be forever changed because of that. So come, Lord, and transform us from the inside out. In your name we pray. Amen. So as the worship team leads us, I want you to invite you to stand and sing with us, dance if you want to. The altars are open. You come and pray if you'd like to.
once and for all, oh, once and for all, help me to lay it down, oh Lord, I lay it down, help me to lay it fun fact about me is I don't like to dance. Um, I hate dancing. It, make, it just unnerves me. I would never go to dances when I was younger because I just, I'm the wallflower. I go against the wall. And uh, my wife hates that about me because she loves to dance and, uh, and I, I don't. But I, I was at Disney Springs one day with my, my daughter, Emma, and her friend, Natalia, and uh, for her birthday. And, and Disney Springs is like this uh, big like shopping area near Disney. And, uh, and they have live entertainment all around. And, and there's one group in there that does like improv rapping. And so they get like suggestions from the crowd and they come up with some rap and, and, uh, and we love them. And so we would always find where they were and go watch their show. And, and I'm the sucker in the crowd. Like every time I'm in a crowd and it's like crowd participation, I always get picked. It never, I, I, don't, I never make eye contact. Maybe that's my problem, I don't know. I'm the one looking down or looking at the birds or whatever, because I don't want to be picked. But they were doing this thing where, where they would call out an animal and then the person had to make a dance up that had to do with that animal. And, uh, and they picked me. And, and I was like, I am, if I don't do it, they're, they're gonna shame me in front of like 300 people. And I'm like, oh, I'm not going to be shamed. And Emma's like, oh, we'll do it for you, Dad. I'm like, I got this. Like, I got this. And so we were there, and it was my turn, and, and I got giraffe. And I had to make some dance up that had to do with the giraffe. And I'm going to teach it to you today because I want you to live life dancing, and I want you to leave here today with joy in your heart. So everybody put your hands out like this, okay? And we're going to do, what is, what is this called, the cabbage patch, something like that, right? So you're going to do that. Keep doing it, right? And then, and then, and then we're going to do the giraffe. Are you ready? Here's the giraffe part. That's the draft part. All right, so let's try it. You ready? One, two, three, let's go. Do the cabbage patch. You can start shaking your hips. It's okay. We're in church. You can do it. It's all right. You're not going to go to hell for shaking your hips. And now you ready? Here comes the draft. One, two, three. There you go. So now you know a new dance. So go and dance today. And uh, let me share some steps with you real quick while you're doing the giraffe and your rain, or you're like, I'm going to have nightmares for the rest of my life. My wife's watching. She's like, I can't believe you did that. But um, so here you are. Uh, you're going to leave dancing today, but there's some steps that you want to take. The first step that we always encourage, if you said yes to Jesus today, uh, we want to get a yes box in your hands. And in this box is a Bible, and this box is a devotion to help you get started in your relationship with Jesus. And, uh, and these are out in the next steps area. They don't cost anything. We just want to get one in your hands. We want to help you in your new relationship with Jesus. So make sure you stop by and grab one of these in the next steps area. The second step that we talk about a lot around here is generosity. And we are a generous church. We give, we give, and we give. 10% of everything that you give goes back into the community and to the world. And so, uh, so this is your giving matters. So I just want to say thank you for your generosity. If you've never given before, I encourage you to start today. There's an offering box right outside the double doors as you leave. You can drop your offering there, or you can give online at warehousechurch.life forward slash give. Uh, another next step that you might want to take if you're new around here, uh, you might want to become a partner. And so we have our next partnership class happening on July 17th. That's a Sunday at 12:30. We'll provide lunch and childcare. You just come. Uh, we don't call uh, people members members around here. Other churches use the word members. Uh, we don't like that term. We feel like better off that you're a partner. You're partnering with us and carrying the mission of God uh, through the world. And so if you want to become a partner, uh, maybe you just need a refresher. You're like, I haven't done that in a while. So maybe you need to just come and be refreshed, but you can
can text on the number on the screen, uh, text the word partner, and uh, you can uh, sign up for that. Warehouse students, tonight you're going bowling at Bowl Riot in Prestonsburg, uh, so you'll need to bring $12 for bowling and then any extra money you want for food or games. Uh, meet there at 6.30, we'll be, or meet there at 6, sorry, meet there at 6, and we'll be done at 7.30. Uh, so uh, if you need more information, uh, reach out to Brenton. Uh, finally, if this is your first time at Warehouse Church, welcome. We're so glad if you're wor- worshiping online, welcome to you as well. Uh, we'd love for you to fill out this welcome home card that you got in your white gift bag, or you can fill out the digital connect card online and uh, drop it off at the welcome desk. And we have a wonderful gift we'd love to give to you, or we'll send one to you online if you let us know you're with us. And, uh, and just our way of saying thanks for being with us today. And finally, next Sunday is 4th of July weekend, right? And so we're still having worship, and we're going to worship at one service, and that's going to be at 11 o'clock next Sunday, and we're going to talk about having freedom in Christ, and uh, we're going to have stuff for the kids. The kids are going to come down and spend some time with me. It's going to be a blast. They're going to have busy bags. We're going to have some amazing worship. It's just going to be a wonderful Sunday, so I hope that you'll join us as we celebrate our freedom in Christ uh, next Sunday. So don't forget that. Have a great week, and go outside and teach someone else the giraffe.